Welcome to the Sisterhood of Sweat. Today's guest is Stephanie Grinke. Stephanie is a registered dietitian, pre and post natal corrective exercise specialist, maternal mental health expert, military wife, and mama of two boys. Currently, she resides in San Diego. Stephanie helps mamas navigate the entire journey to motherhood. After battling postpartum anxiety, Stephanie is passionate about maternal, paternal, mental health, helping families set themselves up for success before baby comes and navigating the transition to parenthood. She is the program director for Whole 30s Whole Mama Club and the co-creator of Whole Mama's Pregnancy Program and a co-host of the Whole Mama podcast. Stephanie is committed to building a community of moms who encourage each other and share their own experiences so moms know they're not alone and they have resources so that they can feel empowered. And I just think that is so important because I can remember, well, I was a young mom with my first one, just being like feeling that aloneness because I stay, I chose to stay at home and I I was on a military base. I, I remember just feeling kind of alone at first until I kind of got into some mom groups. And then again, when I had my youngest at 34, I was kind of, at that time, I was kind of an older mom. So it was then again, I had to navigate where can I not feel alone, like I'm on an island by myself. So I'm super excited to dive into all sorts of topics, all things motherhood today with Stephanie. And without further ado, I want to welcome the one, the only Stephanie Grinke to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm so glad to be here. Yeah, absolutely. I, I've been reading, uh, I've been on your website, Whole Mamas Club, reading your blog, and I went and was on the podcast today, just kind of surfing around, and uh, I came up with all sorts of questions, but I thought I might start with what you you guys are most known for, which is the Whole30 plan, and kind of give the listeners a rundown on what is Whole30. Yeah, so Whole Mamas is the motherhood arm of the Whole30, and so over on that channel, we talk about all things related to preconception, pregnancy, postpartum, breastfeeding, and life with a teenager, like the entire spectrum. And we have blogs and podcasts and programs there. And so that's really what Whole Mamas is. And Whole30 is a plan that a lot of people know about now. It is like a household name. And what it is, is it is a 30-day reset for your health, your habits, and your relationship with food. So for 30 days, you're focusing on the most nutrient-dense anti-inflammatory foods that are out there, and that includes moderate amounts of animal protein, lots of vegetables and fruit, and healthy fat. You're centering your plate around those things, and you're pulling out some of the foods that research and our personal experience has shown to cause inflammation and gut disruption and, you know, a a troubled relationship and patterns with food. And you do that for 30 days. And at the end of the 30 days, what you do is you evaluate how you're feeling, how your skin looks, your your headaches, your overall happiness, and then decide what is going to look best for you going forward. And so you're removing these foods and then you're systematically introducing them one by one to see whether or not those foods work or do not work for you. So it's, a, it's a, like a gold standard elimination diet. The point isn't to be on a Whole30 forever. The point isn't to do it to lose weight. The point is to figure out what a healthy diet is going to look like for you. Because it's different for everyone, isn't it? You got it. Yeah. And that's really what we teach in functional medicine is that there's no one size fits all approach when it comes to food. We got to figure out what you do well with, what you like to eat and what you can be consistent with. Because if we can find a program that meets all those requirements, things that make you feel good, things that, things that make you don't, you're not deprived on it. And then something that you can have for a lasting, um, you know, for the rest of your life, that is a a great plan. Yeah. And it might change. Sounds really great, but I know like um, 
like with pregnancy, you yeah. might have to change that up a little bit. What is your whole mama 30 for pregnancy? What's, what things do you change? Do you add more calories? Do you take out certain foods? Yeah. So if you are, we don't focus on calories with the whole 30. So you can really have it be at various levels of caloric intake, depending on your needs, your athleticism and all of that. So we don't really focus on calories, but it is true in the second and third trimester of pregnancy, you're going to re require more calories, about 300 in the second trimester, about 450 in the third trimester. And really, if you're going on to breastfeeding 500 calories while you're nursing. So there is an increase in calories. So you will notice more hunger. You will naturally gravitate towards eating more food once you get out of that first trimester and you're not feeling as nauseous. So what is different about a Whole30 approach during pregnancy is we really take it day by day. You know, there are some people who start the Whole30 and they don't know that they're pregnant and all of a sudden they're doing the Whole30 and the nausea creeps up on them. And we never tell people to push past it, like don't listen to your body. We really want you to listen to your body during pregnancy. So we're more lenient that, you know, totally stop if you need to during your pregnancy. And we never push it on anybody. We don't think that you have to do a whole 30 during pregnancy. We think that it can help, but isn't something that we require in our programs. Um, we also are a little bit more lenient on snacking. So with the typical whole 30, you want to focus on three balanced meals or maybe a fourth if you are athletic, uh, after your workout. And with pregnancy, we say, you know what, you might need to snack. You might need to snack in the first trimester if you are dealing with that morning sickness. And we know that more balanced meals throughout the day, including some snacks, will help keep that blood sugar stable and help you with that nausea. Or maybe you are in the third trimester and you barely have any room in there, and so you can only handle small meals without experiencing heartburn or just fullness. And so that might be a reason for including more snacks in your Whole30. And then we look at the most nutrient dense foods too, which the whole 30 already does, but we look at it from the context of pregnancy. So in the first trimester, we really want you to be having those leafy greens and those folate rich foods. And in the, the last trimester, we really want you to be focusing on the omega threes, EPA and the DHA and the fatty fish that are going to support your baby's brain development and all of that. So of course you can eat those foods throughout your entire whole 30, but we give you some understanding of what is going on with your baby's development and what might be specifically beneficial for you and your baby at that time. How important do you feel that it is for uh, women in pregnancy to keep their, try to keep their nutrition in line for both the mom and the baby? Yeah, I think it's really important. We're seeing that there is something called fetal programming, which what mom experiences while baby's in utero, her diet, her lifestyle, her exercise behaviors, it impacts a baby's lifelong health and actually future generations. So we're finding out more and more about this in the research. So I think it is really important. And with that being said, pregnancy is sometimes out of your control. There's a lot of things that happen with the morning sickness. So we've got to have that grace at the same time. But the more that we can try our best to consume foods that are really nutrient dense and whole foods based and create these beautifully balanced meals, that's going to serve us well. It doesn't have to look perfect. Nobody is eating a perfect pregnancy diet, so I don't want to give that approach. But if, if as much as we can with moving, even that if that's just walking after dinner, it's really going to serve us well and lead to better outcomes for our own pregnancy and then for our baby's health. So what do you think? Are we eating for two? We aren't eating for two when it comes to looking at the exact nutrient needs. And so it can be, it can be fun in it to, to live by that perspective and have that extra piece of cake or have that extra bowl of ice cream. And there's nothing inherently wrong with that if it's done every once in a while. But if we're doing that day in and day out, it can lead to excess weight gain. And really, when it comes to how much we should be eating in addition, those 300 extra calories in the second trimester, that really only equates to maybe an avocado or a few tablespoons of nut butter or you know just a little bit extra. It's not a huge entire meal or another huge entire bowl of um, ice cream. So yes, the, the goal isn't to restrict or to be so hung up on the calories but we don't need as much as sometimes we think that we do. Yeah, I mean, I think in, in moderation and you also want to think about how you want to feel during pregnancy yeah. and how you want to feel after. And I know sometimes as moms, we may lose that sexy feeling during pregnancy. Uh, 
and just as moms in general, we may, we may lose it a little bit because we feel like we're last on the list or we may feel a little overwhelmed. What are some suggestions to help moms keep feeling sexy all throughout motherhood, through pregnancy and all of that? Yeah, well, I think there's a couple of things. So one, looking at what you're putting in your body and what you're eating. So you're going to feel you know, a little bit bloated or you're going to have indigestion if you're eating foods that aren't working for you. And that's different for everybody. And so if you're somebody that doesn't really tolerate dairy, but you are eating that ice cream, for example, or if you know that maybe you have a gluten intolerance and you're having more bread and, and those kind of carbs than usual, that is not going to make you feel very sexy. If you're feeling bloated and you're just you're feeling uncomfortable in your body. And so looking at your diet. We, you know, if we're having a nice balanced low sugar smoothie in the morning and we're having a salad, we're going to not feel like we would if we went to Taco Bell and these different um, restaurant trains. So definitely how you eat can affect your self image and self confidence and just overall, um, contribute to a well-being. Then moving your body. And so taking a walk or getting your blood circulating can make you feel like you're more in control of your weight. And, you know, we can only control our weight gain to a certain degree. Your body may just do what it wants to do. But if you can be moving your body, I mean, that extra little spark of testosterone, that feeling that you get, that endorphin when you come back from the gym might make you feel more, um, just more strong, you know, mentally and physically. And then also, um, you know, sometimes it, it does happen in the second trimester. Women feel a little bit more like into it. I hear this every now and then, um, not always, but you know, hormones do play a role. And so looking at ways that you can modify what you're doing in the bedroom, making sure you're using enough lubricant because there can be some changes that happen during there. Um, there's a lot of things that we can do, but I would say diet and lifestyle play a huge role in how you're feeling overall. And then one other thing is looking at what you're wearing. You know, sometimes we refuse to purchase those maternity clothes or we refuse to purchase larger sizes because we're just, we don't want to go there. Like we want to use our other clothes and we have a hard time going up in sizes. But if you find something that really fits really well for you, you're going to feel more confident. And this is during pregnancy and in postpartum, finding clothes that fit and not trying to squeeze into something because you want to get back there eventually. Yeah, I think it's just really owning who you are and yeah. self-care is good during pregnancy as well as it is when you're not pregnant. And like, you know, wearing a cute maternity outfit that actually, you know, fits. I mean, my my niece, we went to a baby shower on Sunday and she was just so adorable. She yeah. was so cute in her dress that she had on and she was just all put together well. And so I, I just really thought and do think many, many women that I see are so beautiful when they're pregnant and they oh, just yeah. have this special glow about them. So I think that, you know, there's no need for, I think, of in the past where people might be feeling not so great. They think they don't look good because they're pregnant. I think own that pregnancy and, you know, dress it up. Yeah. And there are so many different options for, even if you don't want to purchase maternity wear, that's really cute. You can rent them. I mean, like rent the runway has a section and there's a lot of different ways where you can get the maternity clothes where you're not like investing so much, but you're just playing around with the styles and maternity wear has come a long way since I know when I, even I had my baby, but my mom had her baby. So you can really rock the maternity wear. Yeah, for sure. So how does exercise, I know for myself personally, um, when I started into fitness, I started teaching as a pregnant instructor. So mm -hmm. I got the job, I was on an Air Force base, and I had no idea I was pregnant at the beginning of it all. So I said, yes, I'll, I'll do the instructing, I'll teach. And so I thought, well, I'll, I mean, I, I did really know very many moms back then. I mean, 56, I don't know very many moms that had worked out while they were pregnant back then. So it was kind of like, um, you know, I, I just did what felt good. I didn't do, you know, any kind of laying down on my back after a certain point for abs and things like that. But I really bounced back quickly. And I think as far as just 
feeling good overall. A lot of my friends, they said they didn't really think of me as pregnant because I was just doing all of the things I did before. So I think that that's a good way to approach pregnancy unless you have some kind of high risk or anything like that. It's just do the, do things somewhat like you did before and it'll feel, I think, more, you'll feel more yourself. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the whole landscape of prenatal exercise has come a long way. It used to be that we were warned against doing anything, you know, just like make sure you sit and be comfortable and walk if you want to. And now the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, which is the, the leading board, is saying 30 minutes of moderate intensity exercise every day. And you can continue doing what you were doing before you became pregnant as long as it's a safe activity for you. You know, it's not something where you're going to get hit or you're going to fall or experience any kind of injury, especially to your abdomen. So, you know, we are realizing the importance of it for maternal outcomes, for fetal outcomes. And if you haven't worked out before you get pregnant, it kind of used to be suggested that, well, okay, if you weren't working out before you got pregnant, then don't work out. But now times are changing and we're saying, no, you can still start a routine. It may not be smart to say, I'm going to go from nothing to I'm going to run a marathon, but you can go from doing nothing to starting to walk. And then when you get your cardiovascular rate up, you can choose an activity that fits what you're able to do comfortably. So I think it really does make a difference in and how we're feeling and the pregnancy outcomes if we do move our body and it's completely safe to do so. Your doctor will tell you, you can have that conversation during your pregnancy and then after your pregnancy, you're on the six week checkup to really get an understanding of what that could look like for you and if there's any contraindications. Yeah, and I think they still just kind of warn you about the abdominal exercises on yeah. your back at a certain point because you don't want to shut off any oxygen flow to the baby or blood flow by laying on the vena cava. And also, you don't want to get rectus diastasis, which is all that separation in the abdominal muscles. So you have to be somewhat careful with the abs you do in the last trimester. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And the, really, if you're laying on your back in the second or third trimester, the problem comes up if you are feeling nauseous or lightheaded or dizzy. You may feel comfortable, but again, you yeah. don't want to be laying there for Just a couple of you, minutes. Yes. Yeah. And you can elevate yourself and use different props to get you about 15 degrees or so ele elevated, and that will make a difference in the blood flow and your feeling. And then, yeah, with diastasis recti, I, I think it, it really comes down to making sure we are in alignment throughout the day. And including how we're exercising. And so if you think about like diastasis recti, like you said, is the, the separation that happens between your abdominal muscles, your, your rectus abdominis, and that's natural. Everybody's really going to have that during pregnancy because your body has to make room yeah. for the baby, right. Right. but it becomes to. a yeah, it becomes a problem if it if it stretches too much right. or that tension is compromised. And so all of a sudden you're seeing bulging and coning in the abdominal area. And so what we want to do with moms is, you know, definitely look at what exercises are doing. Be cautious with things like abs and planks and sit-ups and, and those kind of exercises where there's a downward pull or a crunch in the abdomen where you're creating more pressure but also looking at how mom is moving throughout the day you know so we when we think about what a pregnant woman looks like usually she's got her belly in front of her her head may be like jolted forward um her her pelvis is tilted and so if we're in that type of alignment all day or most of the day that's creating a lot of pressure in our abdomen that's creating a lot of um it can create a lot of back pain and just discomfort in our, in our shoulders too. Cause as our breasts get bigger, I mean, it's not uncommon for a woman to go from like a size B cup to a size double D cup. And so then you've got that extra weight. So like strengthening her back muscles can help really get her in alignment so that when she has that extra weight, she's not completely out of alignment and causing more issues, not only with her core, but also her back and her pelvic symphysis and all that. Keep what about in. like yoga? Can they, can we do down dog or is that out? Like wh what type is that contraindicated at all? Or can we pr pretty much just listen to our body and do it throughout? Yeah. With yoga, I mean, everybody has the, what feels more comfortable for them, but things to look out for are deep twists where you can shut off the blood, blood supply. So when you're in a deep twist and you're holding it for a certain period of time, you just want to make sure that you aren't shutting off the blood supply and the oxygen. Um, we want to make sure that, you know, even if you're going upside down, well, that may not be the best, although some people still do that. Um, we want to look at the, the heat. So looking at hot yoga may not be the best for a woman who wants to keep her core 
temperature down to really protect baby. You know, I've, I know there are some hot yoga instructors who have been doing it for a while and they feel comfortable continuing with it. We all have our own stories and our preferences, but you know, it's just things to look out for is we don't want to be doing anything that could compromise the blood supply to the fetus or cause internal overheating. And running, what about if I'm running, you know, is it, is it true or is it kind of an old wives tale that um, all the impact is going to kind of wear down my bladder and uterus? Should I wear like some type of uh, pregnancy running belt or am I going to be okay if I continue to do my five miles every morning? Yeah, so runners really like to run and they really want to consider or continue running during their pregnancy. What I find is that, yeah, once you get into like the mid second trimester, definitely your third trimester, there is a lot of weight and there's a lot of pressure that is going downward on, on in your pelvic area. And that can be enough discomfort for people to say, nope enough. And then there are runners where they say, nope, I'm going to kind of push through it. So a couple things to think about is you do have your pelvic floor is supporting all of the organs and it's supporting the extra weight that is coming from your baby. And so if you're continually pounding the pavement and you're going to create extra pressure, there's no doubt about that. Some bodies can handle it better than others. Some, you know, you start running and you are automatically have to go pee, right? Because there is a lot of pressure that's coming <laughs> or you have urinary continence, you know, you, you can't make it to the bathroom. You just, you pee. And so those are clear signs that it's probably too much for you at that point. If you are experiencing those things at no point, do you want to be experiencing um, any pain or feelings of prolapse or any discomfort? That's a, a really strong sign that what you're doing is too much for you even if it's outside of running. So I don't think you have to stop running, but there are some things to look at and really keep an eye on how you're feeling with any type of exercise. If at any point it's not working for you, it's time to take a step back and either reduce the amount that you're running or the, um, the amount that you're lifting or the frequency to make it work to you know, really support what you wanna do with what's best for your body. Wow, this is so great today because these are things that I, you know, when I was having my kids, I was like, oh, I wish I had a roadmap, somebody to tell me, you know, is this okay, not okay? You know, uh, I think a lot of things were just kind of like trial and error. You were figuring it out as you go. And the same thing with having children, you know, yeah. you're like, I wish they came, they each came with a manual. <laughs> I know you're talking about how you prepare people for, you know, for pregnancy, for having children, for being paternal or maternal. Can you kind of tell us uh, how do you prepare people for that? And what are some of the things that you do? Yeah. So I think a lot of us prepare more for what the baby's room is going to look like, or, you know, the, the stuff that we're going to get for a baby, than we do what it's actually going to look like. And so, you know, I work in private practice. I also have programs that I'm creating. And, and as part of the postpartum program that we're creating, we're really talking about big picture discussions that can help support and navigate that transition. And so looking at things like, what is your environment set up like? Like how, to, to the point of like, are you walking in your house and you feel overwhelmed as it is because you have so much stuff. And so maybe before baby comes, instead of focusing on like getting all this new baby stuff, is like, what can we get rid of? Because we all know how it feels when you walk into a bedroom and your bed is made and it's clean. That is such a feeling of like calm and peace versus if you walk into your bedroom and there's clothes all over the floor and the bed isn't made. So even thinking about things like how do you feel in your current environment right now and how can we set up your environment so it doesn't feel overwhelming and how can we get some systems in place and to, to talking about your relationship. So how are you feeling with your partner? Who, what, who is responsible for what? Oh, you know, for and, sure. And that having, can cause all kinds of friction, right? If you don't know yeah. that going in. Yeah. Because I mean, how many things do you do just naturally automatically on a daily basis where you, your partner or your loved ones have no idea that you're doing that. And once baby comes and you're trying to focus on your recovery and what's going on with you, you're not focused on all the minutia and those things can be forgotten or bills can be not paid or, you know, all of a sudden you're not getting the groceries delivered or whatever it is. And that just feels taxing. And I feel like as women, we have a hard time asking for what we need. And so being just really upfront, even before the baby comes of like, here is a list of things that I'm doing right now. And when you write that list, you're going to be like, 
how does one person do all of that? But writing down all of those things and then figuring out, okay, what do I feel good about delegating? Because there's going to be some things as a woman that you just want to take care of. Like, you know, you do it really well and you really want to keep that control. And then there's going to be things where you're like, yeah, somebody else can do that. Like, I hate taking out the garbage or no, you can totally do my laundry. That's fine. And then figuring out what that would look like. Is that something you're going to delegate to your partner? Is it something that you're going to say, okay, friends that want to come visit me to see the baby, this is like your ticket to entry. Like if you want to come and hold the baby, then I want you to help out with this task. Like walk the dog and then you can hold the baby. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> or, you know, do you want to hire it out? Do you want to um, have groceries delivered to your doorstep? Do you want to hire somebody to watch your toddler? Um, and just really be realistic and almost to a point where you're like, I don't think I need that much help. Like that's probably how much help you actually need when you have your baby. And so really getting things lined up so that you are taken care of and you can rest those first 30 days if possible. I mean, that's really what a lot of cultures do is they have the sitting, like sit the month, right? Where they have people take care of them so they can really nourish their body and, and repair from that delivery. And then, you know, as a dietitian, I focus a lot on food. And so you know, we talked about how food can play a role in how we are feeling and how we're thinking and it can impact our mental health. And so having food ready to go, having really healthy options at your fingertips so you're not grabbing for something that is a processed food bar or a fast food all of the time in the postpartum period can make a huge difference. So what I talk about here is, you know, in the last trimester, could you double whatever you're making and then freeze that for after baby comes? You know, if you're making a ground Good beef. Idea. Yeah. Because, you know, sometimes what we like to do, and I did this with my first and I learned after my first is I had a weekend where I just did a massive meal prep to get all these frozen meals for baby. And when you're in your third trimester, you don't want to be standing that long in the kitchen. Like you're like tired. You don't want to be like meal prepping and planning all day. Some people do and it can work out, but it might be easier to just do it little by little and just store things away for later. Um, setting up a meal train so that people are delivering food to your door at specific times throughout the week, whenever you feel is best. And so there are websites that you can go on, say, Hey, look, here are my food preferences. Here's when I would like you to deliver food and they can sign up and leave it at your door or bring it in and hang out with you if that's more comfortable. So meal trains are great. Um, and then, you know, we, we have all these options. We have food that can be delivered to our door. We can have meals that are delivered to our door. We have meal boxes that have the ingredients all lined up for us. So using those things to our benefit so that we can nourish ourselves well in the postpartum. Yeah, I think, I think that that's key. And that's really a good tip about doing the meals in advance. I really never thought of it. And what are some other tips that you can give moms to help? Because I think that we get stuck in overwhelm. When you have a baby, you really didn't know what to expect. You didn't really realize that the myth, it wasn't a myth about being up every night late mm-hmm. and the baby crying and all of that. What are, and also, I, let's say you, you have a baby and you have a two, two-year-old or, you know, what are some ways that we can help ourselves not to be overwhelmed? Well, there, I think just being realistic with what you can and can't do and what your priorities are on a day-to-day basis is important. And so if we were somebody that liked a really clean house before baby came, we have to be realistic that it's probably not going to be as clean, right? We're going to have to compromise in some area of our life. We can't try to maximize and make everything perfect. And so figuring out what your priority is every day, and maybe it's just three things. Maybe your priority is making sure that baby's fed, making sure you are resting as much as possible and, you know, doing one thing, like making something for dinner that night. Like we have to really lower the bar for ourselves instead of thinking high picture. I think asking for help is so important. We really do want to do all the things. And so, like I said, with that list, making sure we are delegating as much as we can. I think 
um, getting help for our, our toddler. Even if we think, you know, we have a toddler, we're going to have this baby, maybe think about, you know, can we do a, a baby share with somebody else where your friend or your neighbor takes a baby a couple of days or your toddler a couple of days a week so you can have time to rest with your baby and your toddler can get their, their run out and their energy out and you don't have to pay for it. Or maybe think about, do I want to put my, my toddler in a daycare for a couple of hours a week or part-time so that I can just focus on me and the baby and healing and I'm not trying to watch my toddler for the, the, the disaster he's making in the other room while I'm trying to like hold my baby and figure out breastfeeding and all of that kind of stuff. So getting as much support as we can, and it's hard. I mean, in the U.S., we we don't have the maternity leave, the paternity leave that we really need. We often aren't living by families. Um, and so if you can get your, your family member or a family member to come stay with you for a little bit to help reduce some of the housework, that can be really helpful. Um, I know some families will even like move in with their their family or their in-laws to take off some of the pressure. Um, finding your support groups, you know, going to those mommy and me classes and seeing all the resources that are available to you can be helpful. And so like there are some places like MOPS where you can go and you can drop off your kid and you can have an hour with other moms and just get that really necessary me time. Or you can find a local gym that has a daycare and drop your little one off so you can get that necessary me time. Because as we were talking about, if you can exercise and you can take that time for you that self-care, you're going to feel less overwhelmed and be able to come back into your role as motherhood feeling more refreshed. I think that that's huge. And I know I can identify with moms out there that, you know, for me, you know, I was a young mom, then I was an old mom. I was never like, I felt like never in the you right, were like, mom. you know, and so I kind of think I felt alone at times and like, you know, I felt like I was on an island alone, you know, I'm like 19, a stay at home mom. And I remember there were no other moms around like at first, you know, on the base there were, but when we were like in an apartment, when my husband began being a recruiter, it, it was like, there was nobody around. I felt like I was the only mom at home then, you know? Yeah. And I think then when I was an older mom, I was working and having children and had older children. So how can we make ourselves feel less alone and realize we are not on an island by ourselves? Yeah, I mean, that's really why we created the pregnancy program and the upcoming postpartum program is because you, you almost need that convenience too. I mean, it's one thing to feel alone, but then if you are a new mom and you're juggling multiple kids, like going to those new mom groups is, can be hard or you know, right. finding time for yourself can be hard. And so I think it's really great. It's a, it's a, social media is great on, in some aspects and then hard on others because we have the comparison trap. But like even going on social media and meeting people in your local area or seeing that you're not alone. I mean, I do not think mid thirties is an old mom at all. I know um, back know. then it was. <laughs> then, I, that's the weird thing is I'm 56 now. Yeah. So yeah. like, I felt like I never hit that window where I was just like in the right, you know? Yeah. Space. Yeah. yeah. And no, it's really, it's really about finding that, that tribe. And that's, you know, in our pregnancy program, we have women across the board, different um, ages, different styles of parenting, different, you know, uh, how they identify themselves with gender. So it really, we, that's one thing that we strive to do is bring moms together in a, in a community that is really supportive and we're not going to judge you for what you're doing. We're just going to give you tools and resources. Um, so yeah, I, I think- that. That's, yeah. that's what we needed way back when I know. we created it. So I admire you so much for just thinking of it and getting out there and creating a community for women. Yeah, thank you. No, we absolutely love it. And I mean, that's the reason we actually launched Whole Mamas is we started off as just a pregnancy program. And when women came to us, they signed up for the program, they got into the Facebook group, and all of a sudden, you know, they may have joined even before baby came, and now their babies are like three and four, and they're still in the group. And so we kind of asked the question like, oh, that's so cool, you know, I, we love that you're here, but why, you know, why are you still here? And it's because that support is so 
needed and, and it's not found elsewhere. And so these moms want to stick with us and give advice. I mean, it's wonderful. It feels so good to be able to give advice to a mom that may be struggling and, and you have that similar struggle and you can offer her a few suggestions of what worked for you. Everybody loves to do that. And so that's really, we went from that pregnancy program to creating whole mamas to provide a wider scope of support. I love that because it's really, you know, that's what my podcast is really all about, yeah. strong women and empowering achieving together and women women coming together to support one another, you know, and collaborate and help each other, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And we all have different tools. We all have different ways to approach this one situation. And it's just, you know, it's taking the information that you're given and saying, yep, I don't want that piece. Oh, yep, I think that piece would work. And figuring out an approach that works for you, just like we were talking about with diet, is there's no one way to parent. And some things will resonate with you better than others. And you just have to take what you like and leave the rest and figure out your own path. Well, I was also uh, online looking at your, you had a podcast or something on meal prep. And uh, what are some easy meal prep ideas? Because that seems to be the biggest thing that women are struggling with because they're, a lot of them are working, they're pregnant, they have children, and they want to eat right, but just, oh my gosh, I have no time to prepare food. What do I do? Yeah, so I have two tools that I use quite often in my practice and when I'm talking to moms are the fact that if we can create an ingredient meal, which is basically different different components of healthy nutrient foods, we don't have to think about elaborate recipes. So what I mean by ingredient meals are taking a type of protein, whatever floats your boat, whatever you feel good on, whether that's shrimp or organic tofu or beef or chicken, then take your produce option that could be fruits or vegetables, whatever the heck you want, and then your healthy fat. So it could be avocados, coconut oil, a healthy dressing that you like, um, nut butter, nuts and seeds, and you create a, a meal based off those components. And so this could look like for breakfast, you have eggs with some berries and sliced avocados and maybe some spinach. So you're not having to create this elaborate recipe, but you have those components that make up a really nourishing diet. Or maybe you do want to make something ahead of time. So you could make a frittata ahead of time and have that throughout the week. And so you're having those eggs and the vegetables and the healthy fat on top of that. Um, then for lunch, what could your lunch look like? Well, you take those three components, your protein, your produce, your healthy fat, and maybe you make a salad. So whatever vegetables that you have in your refrigerator, you put on your plate, whatever protein you have left over from the dinner before or that you pre-cooked, you put on your plate. And then you drizzle it with a dressing or olive oil and balsamic vinegar, good. You're all set to go. If at, at some point you want to add like a, a grain or dairy, you feel good with those foods or beans, you can totally do that too and have that as your side. But if you base your plate around those three major components, you are going to get the most anti-inflammatory uh, nutrient dense options available without having to take more than 10 minutes to create that. Um, so that's really what we talk about. And then also looking at ways you can use gadgets in the kitchen to help you. And so, for example, everybody has a sheet pan. And if you Google sheet pan recipes, you can just throw protein and produce or whatever you want, drizzle it with your fat, throw it in the oven, and you can make a sheet pan meal. So you don't even have to worry about messing up oh, or that's making a great it. idea. Any other, yeah. And then your slow cooker. So slow cookers are making a comeback, that's for sure. And with slow cookers, before you leave for work, you just throw the ingredients in your slow cooker, go to work or hang out with your kids during the day. And at 5 p.m., you have a really healthy meal that was completely hands-off for the most part. Um, and then the Instant Pot, the pressure cookers that are out there. And so those make really quick meals. Uh, you could just you know, throw whatever ingredients you need to in the Instant Pot, set the timer, go play with your kids, go take a shower, whatever you need to do, come back and it's ready for you. And so just kind of implementing those things where you don't make elaborate recipes and you focus on the tools that are going to make your life easier can lead to less time in the kitchen and more healthy food. I like the air fryer. Have you tried that? I haven't tried that, but I know people are obsessed with it. Oh yeah. my what gosh. Do you like to do we it? use it almost every day because yeah. I don't have to stand and watch. Like I made orange crusted cashew chicken before this and I yeah. just put it in the air fryer it was done in 15 minutes I didn't have to stand and watch it yeah you know you just find the timer and my husband 
cooks frequently now, which wasn't, you know, in the past, it was generally me. Now yeah. it's like, because I have like a fitness studio, he'll cook a lot at night. He uses that air fryer. I mean, everything is just done like that. Oh, I love it. I, maybe I'll have to put that on my Christmas list. And evenly, <laughs> like, like, you know, like yeah. if you have beef yeah. or bison or something, yeah. like you don't have to stand and make sure it cooks thoroughly. Love it. Okay. Maybe I'll just have to try that one. It's been like, I'm a like wish list on Amazon. for That and a steamer. Those yeah. are my like yeah. two indispensable items at our household. So, and uh, I have to laugh because when I'm saying milk prep ideas, I think of bad moms and you know, how overwhelmed as moms we are at some point where she's driving, she's got, I think she has spaghetti or something. Oh my gosh. She's I know. eating spaghetti and she stops and it flies everywhere. Uh-huh. And I'm just like, so I know that having these simple tips, where do you have anything online, any resources that the women could go to to help themselves so they don't have a bad moms episode themselves? <laughs> well, I've had plenty of those bad moms episodes too. I remember <laughs> eating like eating food with my baby in the ergo and like dropping food on him while he was sleeping. And I'm like, Oops, sorry. Um, yeah, so on Instagram, I hashtag ingredient meals. That's what where I share a lot of mine. And, and I'm going to be posting more about that too. Um, you know, mine aren't fancy. I like don't post because they're not fancy. But what I find is that whenever I post them, people are like, well, that's how I eat. Like I make ground beef, I put it on vegetables, I put a healthy fan on top, and that's how I eat. And so, you know, I I was kind of intimidated to share, but that's really, truly how people eat. And, you know, I talked to, Instagram can be intimidating when it comes to food. Like, you see what, like, food bloggers are posting, and you're like, (laughs) I know, like, like, the herbs on top, and you're like, should I be making my meals like that? And I had friends with a lot of food bloggers and they do not eat like that. Like if you see 90% of their meals, like they're throwing things in a bowl, just like we are, or throwing chicken thighs in the oven, just like we are. And their job is to make it look pretty. And that's why they spend the extra time. But we're not, nobody's eating like that. Nobody's creating three elaborate meals every single day. So using leftovers to our advantage. Um, you know, one thing that I talk about for busy moms, if feeling really overwhelmed is like, what can we simplify? What do you really like a breakfast or do you really like a specific lunch? Could we think about recycling that multiple times during the week? So if you really like a smoothie or if you really like that frittata, let's keep that on your schedule as many days as we can that you don't get sick of it. And then you don't have to think about it. It's just automatic that you have it. And make sure everything has lids on it because yeah. I'm telling you, I I still remember having a stick chef with the, you know, the, yeah. and I had a protein shake with like flaxseed and hemp and yeah. chia uh, seed or whatever. And it spilled. Oh my gosh, you guys, that was the grossest like mess ever. Chia, chia is hard to get out of things. Yeah. It's like, wow, this should be glue. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. my goodness. Wow. So Well, let me, I just, there was a one more thing I kind of want to cover, which kind of occurred over the weekend. I was at a shower and uh, the topic came up about breastfeeding. I have so many questions surrounding this. And also, I guess there's controversies, you know, galore with the breastfeeding. Uh, First of all, I just want to know, if you are breastfeeding, does this help you to get back into shape a little quicker? You, you're you know, the baby's eating the calories and the things maybe that you've put on. Is it, is my uterus going to shrink back better? What What's the 411 on that? Well, it will, for sure. It will help your uterus shrink back faster. So that's for every woman that's breastfeeding. When it comes to weight loss, it really depends. You know, it, we are burning an extra 500 calories a day for the first six months that we're breastfeeding. So we are getting that significant metabolic increase. And if we're not eating those extra 500 calories, then yeah, we will, we will see weight loss. So some women, they do nothing but breastfeed and the weight drops off of them. For other women, they breastfeed and maybe breastfeeding increases their hunger. So they're eating more than that extra 500 calories, or maybe they're getting up in the middle of the night to breastfeed and then their sleep is compromised. And so they are maybe snacking in the middle of the night or the fact that they aren't getting quality sleep contributes to excess weight gain could be shifts in, in hormones. It could be shifts in the, the stress. I mean, breastfeeding is beautiful, but 
it takes a lot of thought of how much do I have to pump? When do I have to pump? Do I have enough milk? And can I do this during work? Do I have a work break? Like there's a lot of stress that can come with motherhood in general and then with breastfeeding. And so there's a lot of different variables when it comes to does a woman lose weight or gain weight when she's breastfeeding? I don't think it's fair to say that it's just that she loses weight, but it could certainly happen. And it does certainly happen in cases. And then, you know, like some of the controversies, one being like, I remember being at the gym and one of the moms was breastfeeding four kids and wow. And like, how old is too old? Cause she was like, wow, I, I eat whatever I want. I just breastfeed all four and they love it. And, you know, I think the one was like six and I'm thinking, Ooh, I bet that, you know, the teeth, I don't know, but I'm just saying like, <laughs> how old is too old? To be I don't. I think it totally depends on the person. I don't think that there's an age where it's like, no, you shouldn't be breastfeeding. I think it really depends on what mom is comfortable with. And so mom might only be comfortable with breastfeeding until her baby is two years old. Or a mom might feel comfortable breastfeeding longer because she really loves that relationship and her, they're both mutually benefiting from it. And, you know, with the teeth thing, like they learn, they learn. I mean, they learn not to do it. Um, sometimes when they're little, they will bite just because they're figuring it out and they like to see your reaction to things. Like it's almost more about like, what's going to happen if I do this? Um, <laughs> when you get older, that's not necessarily the case, but I don't think there's an age where it's not appropriate. It just depends on what she's comfortable with. And look, you know, we're, we're easy to judge somebody for their choices, but we never know. I mean, it could be that she really just wants to do it and, and there's, it's n not wrong either way. Okay. So what about I am a mom and I have a business meeting and I'm going to breastfeed, you know, just out in the open. I mean, what is your feelings on this? Cause I know, you know, some people think it's natural. I should be able to pop it out wherever I am and just breastfeed. And other people are horrified, like cover that up like why are you exposing yourself you know so what is your take on that yeah I think it's a, a really interesting question and we all have different views on it and so I was one of the moms where I didn't mind just popping it out in an appropriate situation right yeah. like I wouldn't do it with my father-in-law in the room but like if my husband or my mom right. was in the room like I wouldn't care I also right. you know just kind of pop it out in parks because I live in California too so it's almost like acceptable nobody there. cares here um but there are some moms that don't feel comfortable with it for whatever reason and in that case there are lots of gadgets that can kind of cover you up or you can choose to go in a different room or you can choose to make it more secretive uh, but it's it's just really interesting because breastfeeding is so natural and it's a way to feed your baby and i think sometimes we look at it as like well, boobs are just about sex, but boobs are about nourishing. And, you know, I've even heard of some moms where they were told to like go in the bathroom and feed their baby. And it's like, well, would you eat in the bathroom? Like this baby's just trying to do its thing and baby's trying to eat. So yeah, I'm a fan of whatever the mom feels comfortable with it. She should own it and she should do it. And she shouldn't feel like there's judgment either way because she is doing exactly what she thinks is best for the baby. And that is perfect. So nursing blanket or no nursing blanket, it's up to them? It's totally up to them. Yeah. I mean, I really didn't use it, uh, but I don't shame or judge other moms that do because that's what they're comfortable with. Yeah. Because I, I know I've seen a lot of Insta posts recently where, you know, the moms were getting shamed because they were just basically showing the breastfeeding online in the Insta posts, you know, and, uh, so I just kind of wondered, like, it seems like it's somewhat of a controversial subject because you have the people that are very private and feel very uncomfortable with that. And then you have the people that are like, it's totally natural. Yeah. And to the people that are not comfortable with it, like, you don't have to look. You can look away, right? <laughs> there like, you go. You to look at the mom. Right. There you go. This is pretty much the same with anything, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, this has been such a good conversation today. And I just totally want to acknowledge you for creating such a special program for all the moms out there. And just, you know, it's just been such a great talk today. Where can people find you on social media and get all of your products? 
Yeah. Well, so my private account is Seth Granke. So I share a lot of maternal mental health. So S T E P H G R E N. G-R-E-U-N-K-E. I can spell my last name. So Steph Garinke. Um, that's, I share mental health stuff. I share ingredient meals. I share like what's going on with my family and just updates with health and nutrition in the prenatal postpartum world. And then Whole Mamas Club is the brand that has all the programs. And we talk about information, like I said, from preconception to life with teenagers. And that's where our programs are. Well, that's where the podcast is. Um, Whole Mamas Podcast, you can find it on your favorite podcast player or on our website directly, wholemamasclub.com. Wow, that is so awesome. Well, thank, thank you so you. much. And thanks everybody for listening today to the Sisterhood of Sweat. Make sure to leave Whole Mamas a glowing review and let us know how much you enjoyed the podcast today. Thanks everyone. Thank you.